Well, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies. This is a podcast where we explore thoughts in philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. Uh, I just want to give a shout out to the Patreon supporters. A couple of you guys joined this week. Um, there's a whole bunch of new stuff over there at Patreon, stickers and mugs and all sorts of stuff you uh, you can get for different tiers of support. If you guys like this show, if you benefited from it, please uh, stop over there and consider being uh, becoming a, a patron. Uh, another way you guys could support me is going to Apple Podcasts and giving me a five-star review and a comment. That would really help. It helps with the algorithms and everything. Um, if you've appreciated this podcast, please do so. Um, but without further ado, let's get into today's topic. Today, we're going to be talking about Hebraic philosophy, the philosophy of the, the Old Testament and uh, as it moves into the New Testament. And I have with me Dr. Drew Johnson, and he directs the Center for Hebraic Thought and is professor of biblical studies at King's College. And my uncle-in-law will be all fired up, fired up about that because he loves King's College. So without further ado, let's bring him in. Dr. Johnson, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Hey, how's it going, Parker? Um, yeah, it's it's going well. Yeah, I, I have two cameras, like my screens down here, so I'm <laughs> sorry that I might be thing. looking down here. Yeah. yeah, no, it's the same yeah. thing for me. I'm trying to figure out this this new camera I got. Yeah, yeah, excellent. Um, well, okay, so Dr. Johnson, um, why are you here? <laughs> I pulled that from from uh, page twenty three of your book because you <laughs> Wait, you were, <laughs> you, were, you were giving yeah, a yeah. talk. You were giving a talk at a philosophy uh, conference, and and one of the questions someone asked you is, "Why are you here?" Yeah. And uh, I was at Oxford. That was like okay. in my mind that I was going to Oxford to give a paper in the British Society for Philosophy of Religion. Like this was the zenith of my fledging, fledgling pre PhD career and gave the paper. And that was uh, I don't know if it was the first one or it, it certainly felt like the first question out of the gates was, um, why are you here? And um, <laughs> and because I was giving a paper that was arguing against you know, a naive omnipresence of God mm -hmm. from the biblical accounts themselves, saying this this just isn't how the biblical authors conceive of God. And so maybe yeah. that should have some purchase on the way we conceive of God. And yeah. um, so they said, yeah, that's not how we make arguments in <laughs> philosophy. Right. Um, which started me on a quest to think like, well, why not? Is, is, you know, is that right? Am I, am I coming at this like with this biblicist, crazy fundamentalist view or is there something to um the thinking of the biblical authors and, and how they conceive of god and, and other yeah. things yeah uh i love that part um i thought that was funny so i wanted to hit you with that do you remember the the view that you used to instead of omnipresence you you had a different view or a different name oh, for the presence yeah what was uh, it polypresence so yeah. god can be anywhere he needs to be simultaneously or otherwise at any yeah. time but it's it's a subtle shift it's kind of like omniscience versus all-knowing omnipotence right. versus all-powerful um yeah. i do have a i edited a book with yoram hazoni on this on the the perfection the question of god's perfections um, so we oh cool i'll have to check that out yeah i wanted to talk about uh about your take uh, versus yoram's take in a little bit um but so so just getting into this um we're going to be talking about your book um and it is it it's called biblical philosophy a hebraic approach to the old and new testaments is that right that's right yeah do it's you know, not even out yet so yeah i was gonna ask what do you know the release date for that it's the end of this month so they've cambridge they physically print the books in england yeah uh, and so they're for sale i think it's for sale now in england um but you have to wait for them to ship over on a barge like from england until they physically get here to the united states so that's what we're waiting on right now yeah Okay, yeah, I got a uh, digital copy, which is fantastic uh, to get ahead of all you guys, all you chumps at home. I got it all up here already. Um, but uh, Dr. Johnson, how do you how do you come to think of scripture, script the the Old and New Testament scriptures, scripture as uh, philosophy? Like, how do you even get started on this path? Um. Well, I became a Christian as an adult, like, or when I was nineteen twenty. I don't know how adult that is, but uh, yeah. that's when I became a Christian. Kind of, I had a radical conversion uh, within a few years. I get, I finished college uh, and started seminary at, at a friend's uh, urging that I, he really thought I should go to seminary. So I went to seminary, and I, I happened to go to seminary at Covenant Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis, Missouri, because it was in St. Louis. That's the reason I went there. Uh, so I didn't <laughs> shop for a seminary like. I wasn't planning on going to seminary. So I just, you know, went there because this guy told me it was a good place to go. And so I went there and it was, it was a tremendously good experience um, and answered a lot of questions and stirred up lots of questions. But one of the things that I appreciated about that experience was um, 
they just had a strong view of biblical theology that you could actually think alongside the big biblical authors and that Exodus has something to say to Deuteronomy, has something to say to Isaiah, has something to say to the gospel of Mark and beyond, mm. which if you know biblical studies, that's that in and of itself is a highly controversial claim right. um, that, that these texts actually might be thinking in the same vein or in some way that's consonant with one another. So, so I kind of came into Christianity as a fairly new Christian going to seminary, already thinking about how the, different parts of the Bible fit together. And then I read a guy named Michael Polanyi, who yeah. is this chemist turned social philosopher. And I was, I was going to do um, research psychology. That was what I was going to do my PhD in originally when this mm. guy talked me into going to seminary instead. I mean, I had lined all my ducks up in a row to go do research psychology. I was really interested in research method, wow. and statistical analysis. Um, and so somebody slipped me Polanyi and I started reading him and it blew my mind. And I was like, mm. how come I've never heard any of this before? I've never thought about this before. So I was thinking about epistemology, theories of knowledge, and um, and having my all my mental furniture on my old positivist, modernist, scientific, scientific view of knowledge. It was all getting rearranged in my head that science is actually about tradition and bias and skill and discernment and connoisseurship mm. and all these uh, things within communities of skilled people and everything that made sense to me. And, and, and well, I don't want to get too far off course, but when I run this past working scientists and engineers, they all have the same experience I did. They'll tell you the old scientific positivist story, like we collect mm -hmm. facts clinically, objectively. And then you you tell them Polanyi's story and they're like, oh, oh no, that that's what we do. Actually, that's right. You know, so yeah. so I knew he was onto something right. And at the same time, I was reading scripture and just seeing like, well, actually, a lot of the th moves that Polanyi is making are the same moves the biblical authors are making. And yeah. Polanyi is a full, full, I mean, he worked with Einstein and on fiber and uh, fiber analysis. And I mean, he, he, you know, yeah, he's yeah. he's as deep in in that project as anybody else. And he, and he is making very similar epistemic moves as the biblical authors which I guess ranked them up in my mind. Like it wasn't like, oh, biblical authors are down here giving us oracles and talking about fluffy religious stuff. Right. And then up here is theologians. And then above theologians are philosophers who really have the, the, the nut of the, of the husk. Right. Um, yeah. So yeah. That, and, and then I went and did a, a master's in analytic philosophy as soon as I left seminary and I was working as a pastor at the same time. Mm. Um, and I kind of had that realization that analytic philosophy has some great skills and tools. Um, but uh, the, it lacked in some significant ways in which I thought the biblical authors were savvy. So I was the whole time I was kind of grinding everything from through like, well, this isn't terribly different than what the biblical authors are doing. They're talking about notions of justice and um, ideals of ethics and, you know, having very similar conversations. They just do yeah. it very differently. Yeah. So eventually um, – through a friendship with a guy named Yoram Hazoni when I eventually went to do my PhD in St. Andrews. Um, I just got bold enough through knowing other people who had been cranking away at this problem longer than I had to just finally say, you know what? I just think it's a philosophical tradition. And the sooner we get on board with that, the, the easier all of our lives will be. Yeah. And I'm saying that as a former pastor, as someone who's still ordained in the, in the evangelical Presbyterian church. And um, I still, do a lot of pastoral counseling uh, with students, et cetera. So I'm not saying that as a, a geek, because I'm not a geek, but um, I'm saying that as somebody who deeply cares about the church and, and Christianity, that um, we need to make this turn, and it's only for our worse if we don't. Yeah. Man, I, I think you're onto that, uh, onto something important. I, I started studying philosophy and theology, and uh, you know, started, you go back to Plato, and you mentioned this in the book, uh, you think, oh, it's just you kind of just have to read Plato and then you're, you know, you kind of move on. But you see what he does and you see how he's dragging you in through these dialogues. And it's like, well, this seems like what's happening in the book of Job. This seems right. like, like Job's like this proto platonic dialogue. And then you hear about the philosopher king and you're like, well, that sounds like Solomon, though. Like that. I, I know someone like that. And right. then you start saying, well, if this is, you know, you start learning about um, uh, no mixed statements and you learn about, uh, you know, uh, wisdom literature and you go wisdom philosophy is supposed to be love of wisdom so right it, it, it all seems like it's starting to match up and then you know pennington has, has argued that historically the church has thought of of jesus as a philosopher and then right. your work here saying no this is a, the uh the ancient near eastern scholars have already thought of this hebraic philosophy it's the it's the bible scholars that aren't getting it right that have some for some reason missed it 
Bizarrely, yeah. And I think it's important. I, I love the way you just said all of that because um, you went to the wisdom literature and and you will notice that, you probably noticed that in that book, I don't go to the wisdom literature at all. Yeah. So I try to make the case without going to Ecclesiastes, all, all the typical jump Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, right. like where, where it's very, I think it's very low hanging fruit, uh, mm -hmm. as it were. Um, and so I try to show like, no, this is a from the garden forward. There's yeah. already like philosophical notions being laid down and sharpened and fine tuned for anybody who's paying half a bit yeah. of attention. So Right. Well, so that you, you mentioned Yoram, um, Yoram Hazoni. Um, so he's got this book, The Philosophy of Hebrew Scripture. And for, for anyone who is a, is a Christian who is into philosophy, you'll know that book. Um, so how does your book differ from his? Yeah, um, a, a, I, you know, I read that book in drafts uh, and gave him lots of notes. And wow. I, I think I ended up in a few footnotes like in typical Yor Yorm is a very close personal friend of mine. But, mm. you know, this kind of like, well, Drew Johnson said this, but I don't agree with him. You know? So <laughs> like that, what you do to your friends when you want to acknowledge that you're friends. Totally. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Don't agree with them, which is fine. Um, Yorm. Um, he's a Jewish philosopher. Um, he's prolific in lots of different areas. And he, uh, what he's trying to do is, again, he's trying to crack the nut. I think he started this conversation in full for a lot of people, especially on mm -hmm. the philosophical side, got them really thinking about it. Um, that book, I would say he also kind of makes more audacious claims than I'm trying to. Um, he, he's really trying to shift people off of their, their mounts where they've kind of settled in and said, there's reason, there's revelation, which I think is a great, I don't even agree with the reason revelation divide and I'm right. not sure he would either, but it's a, it's a, it's an easy enough tool that everybody kind of knows what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, he walks you through, I mean, very basic concepts. So towards the end of my book, I, I revisit his discussion on truth and just the, the biblical notion of truth, which is not radically different than our notion of truth, but sufficiently different that you have to appropriate the biblical view in order to understand what scripture means when they yeah. say things are true. Sure. And you will misunderstand them and you will come into areas of folly like saying, well, this is just absolutely true. And this is this is God's truth, which, which is absolutely true. And therefore it can be nothing else. And you get in all these weird traps of truth talk uh, yeah. today. Mm -hmm. So he he's kind of got multiple fronts where he's trying to get this conversation going and saying, like, look, if you understand, if you just know a little bit of Hebrew, you don't even have to know that much. Just, yeah. just a tiny bit. And you just understand the way they're conceptually shaping and framing things. Um, and, uh, then then a whole world opens up for you here. And don't tell me that this it's because the Hebrews and it's religious texts, you know, because then right. he just points to all. The um, you know he's a philosopher by training, and he just points to all the classical philosophy and says, every single one of those dudes in Greece thought the gods were talking to them through the winds, right? right? right. And giving them insights through the winds. So mm -hmm. you can't tell me that this is an, uh, a reason versus revelation uh, divide, strictly yeah. along those lines. And I push the even further along the literary boundaries of, you can't tell me because it's a narrative, uh, you know, because it's a bunch of stories that it therefore isn't philosophical. Because then right. I'm going to point to all the stories and journal entries and meditations, you know, that that we're reading over here in philosophy and all calling it philosophy all day and all night, right? right? Yeah, and not just so I, I found this uh, this helpful too. Not just the uh, the Renaissance uh, philosophers or the modern, early modern, or you know, Plato, but you you brought up uh, Frank Jackson's "What Mary Didn't oh, yeah. Know." <laughs> yeah. I was like, dude, I had never thought of it like that, but that yeah. that's so true. It's a story, and it's really it's a, a parable or it's an parable, allegory. Yeah, I think. yeah, yeah, something. yeah, yeah. I, thought uh, yeah, I mean, however you want to frame it. I, I actually, I. I don't remember who gave me that one, but I was somebody, I don't know if somebody told me that when I was saying, Hey, help me think of some more like literary devices and philosophy. Yeah. I don't, somebody gave me another one that was in that same category, which cued my memory. Oh yeah. Uh, what Mary didn't know, which if you don't know what did, Mary didn't know, it's a very power. I mean, we would all say anybody who studied that is like, wow, that's a very powerful argument. Yeah. yeah. But, but yeah. it's an, it's a fictional narrative is what it right. is. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's super, yeah. Super powerful. I think, I think Jackson himself had to like go back on that later because he saw how powerful it really was right? and, and the implications it had for, for, I don't know, dualism or whatever it was that he didn't want. Um, well, so a little, a little more prolegomena before we jump into the actual contents here. So 
what um, what counts as philosophy in this conversation here? What what is philosophy? So um, I naively set out to just say like, let's just find a good working definition of philosophy, and then we'll we'll compare and just say, okay, well, does the Hebrew Bible, does the New Testament do anything like that? I think most people obviously will say they'll jump to the New Testament, and then they'll jump to Paul within the New Testament and say, there's your philosophy. And yeah. I actually try to deconstruct a little bit of what people think about that. The problem I ran into going back to the definition of philosophy is um, there. I, I kind of knew this was the case, but I didn't think it was as bad as it really is. There is no singular definition of philosophy that everybody agrees. There's not even like a cluster of definitions that everybody agrees on. Yeah. Um, what you're really getting is, is value propositions. And, <laughs> you know, I, I love Colin McGinn's uh, little story that he tells in the New York Times about when he's, you know, on a plane and people say, what, it, what do, uh, how do people react when you tell them you're a philosopher? And they're like, oh, I love philosophy. I love thinking deeply. And he's like, yeah, we don't do that. We uh, we do kind of equations on ontology. You know, that's what I do all day long. On, right? Ontic but, science, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he wants to rename it to the ontic sciences right. because they're not doing love of wisdom stuff anymore. Um, and that may be an overstatement, but I think there's something generally true about that. So what I try to do instead is say, like, look, there are things that are scholarly. There are things that are kind of logically rigorous. Um and then the, there are things that we would say are philosophical in nature, and mm -hmm. and it's, and I and I I, I and I, again I'm I'm very I was very wary to set up this definition, but I ran it past a lot of people, philosophers and non philosophers, and and people said like okay that works um, is basically you know if you want to think about scholarly is is kind of any kind of rigorous logical enterprise. So people writing encyclopedia are are you know it's mm -hmm. a scholarly scholarly enterprise. Um, obviously there's some philosophical stuff going on in there, but the, the final product you wouldn't call an encyclopedia, uh, necessarily philosophical, right. you know, at least not Britannica or something like that. Um, and in the ancient world, if you think about lexical list, you know, just word list in mm -hmm. uh, Mesopotamia, we wouldn't call it, we might call them scholarly or omenology list of omens. They're yeah. definitely scholarly. They're logically connected. Um, but we wouldn't necessarily say they're doing any thinking about the nature of reality or thinking about the nature of thinking. Um, yeah. You know, thinking about uh, a, a, a cup outside of this particular cup, right? right. For any particular instance. Um, that seems to be the crucial move that most people are identifying as philosophical in some way. Yeah. And then, in, which I, I don't think actually gets you to philosophical philosophy. I think that gets you to speculation. I, I say... It seems to me that what we really want to call philosophy is when you begin training people in your way of speculation. You think mm. there's a particular method of speculating, and that's when we start talking about philosophical schools and trends and styles. And so that, I don't think that's a be-all. I'm not trying to define the world of philosophy. Right. I'm trying to create some buckets that I can throw some, some stuff into and then say, and here's why the Hebrew Bible is, is, is actually doing something much more like Greece and Rome than... Um, than Egypt or Mesopotamia. And then it come to find out this is what ancient Near Eastern scholars have thought for a long time as yeah. well. So I, I found that I found that pretty helpful. And and I was wrestling through it myself. A, a big portion of my audience are philosophers and professors in philosophy. So I'm thinking, you know, how do I how do I help present this in a way that they're not going to nitpick? But then I thought they're they're analytic philosophers. They're going to nitpick this. <laughs> <laughs> there is like look and they should. And yeah, and right. there might be a there might be a fatal weakness in that in that trichotomy that I set up there. And I'm happy to hear it. Yeah, you know the, the books in press and on a barge, so we can't do much about it now. But right, well, I I, I like it. I like the the scholarship was helpful. Then the speculation, and then uh, philosophy, and and you also used um, second order reasoning. That was another part of it. And so oh it's, yeah yeah right. So it's second order. It's it's self reflexive. Um, it's you know metacognition, but it's I, I like saying it's it's in this particular school. And a lot of the analytic folks will say that's kind of the old way of doing things. Sure. But then you could just say, well, yeah, but you guys are doing this as well, right? You're in the analytic school. You're, right. you're, you're being taught to think analytically. And I know there's the, the distinction between continental and analytic, and that might be kind of uh, forced, but right. it's still kind of enough to help situate people. There's a, yeah, there's yeah. always a carrot to the caricature, right? Um, yeah, and that's good. I think um, it, I always advise, I don't know who turned me on to this book, but Bear, Gary Gutting, which mm -hmm. many people will know Gary Gutting because of uh, the Notre Dame 
review of books was done in his name for a long time. Okay. Um, but uh, I think that's him that that started that, or he somehow was involved in that. But uh, he wrote this nice little book, I think, for Oxford called What What Philosophers Know or How Philosophers Know. Oh, I should know the title of it. Sorry, it's over here to my left. No worries. Um, but in it, he reviews the kind of the history of, of analytic philosophy while well, from like Frege forward, uh, which I think yeah. most people would say that's a nice starting point. Yeah, sure. And he just he steps through and shows you how the the big moves uh, that have been widely accepted in analytic philosophy were never done so on linear deductive logic. They're done so on intuitions and values of the philosophers involved. Yeah. And and he's not de demeaning that or diminishing it in any way. He's just saying like this this is the history. Let's be descriptive in how we've actually come to some of the conclusions we've come to. Yeah. It's because we had deep intuitions that there was something right about them, not because we were presented with an ironclad argument about the thing. Yeah, um, that's a helpful and, point. It's, it's almost it's almost reminiscent of like to, uh, Kuhn's uh, you know scientific revolutions, and and you mentioned right. this a little bit too that you're kind of rejecting the evolutionary theory of of theories that right. just right. because it's here doesn't mean it's the pinnacle. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and, and Kuhn's. Uh, paradigm shift I should I always feel obligated to mention is lifted off of four pages of Polanyi. He basically just mm. expanded four pages of Polanyi's yeah. personal knowledge into 200 pages of something, which it could have been 50 pages at max, but he, ex he kept on going. Yeah, um, there, there's probably still some more uh, that you can know from that book, but you can't express because uh, right. that's a <laughs> tacit dimension thing. Exactly. Yeah. But, so you really do know Polanyi. Uh, a little bit. I just Esther Meek, and then I picked up Polanyi from from yeah. there. And oh well, um, then I should say Esther. Esther was the one who is the reason I read Polanyi for the that first makes time. sense. She was teaching at Covenant then, and okay, I couldn't, I couldn't take her class, but a friend said, "Hey, well, since we can't take the class, let's let's just read Polanyi at the coffee shop in the morning." So we did, and. Yeah, he, he lost interest pretty quickly, but I was enthralled. So yeah, that's it. I, I think that's kind of how it goes. If he gets in there, he doesn't really let go. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah, so I, I got it third hand. John Frame to Esther Meek to Polanyi oh, yeah. himself, yeah. and yeah, excellent. Well, so I I did have this one question though, um, and I, I haven't thought about it often. I I have thought about it, but I hadn't thought about it as deeply as when I was reading your book. Is um, so you, you met you you have this discussion what counts as philosophy, and I think you're 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 pretty convincing there. But then I have this next question of what counts as theology then? Um, oh, yeah, you know. So there's like this there's this distinction between philosophy and theology. But if we accept this proposal, you know what what do we make of how do we distinguish uh, demarcate theology from philosophy? So I did stay away from that one with a 10 foot pole. Uh, <laughs> and, 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 well, no, intentionally, because I didn't, in some ways, <clears throat> you, know, you know, when you do interdisciplinary work, as I do, um, it's, you're always choosing the minefield through which you want to walk. Yes. Um, right. And so, and, and, and which minds you in, are intentionally stepping on. So I didn't want to step on that mine. Yeah. I do think it's the right question. Um, I would put, I have put theology and philosophy on a on the same continuum. Okay. Uh, and I don't even know if I'd put them at opposite ends. I've just put them somewhere in the same continuum of speculation, speculative thought and traditions, methods of speculation. Um, and obviously I'm not using speculation in a pejorative sense. Sure. I mean, in a, in a rightful sense that God designed us to. And, um, and I would, now this is my own, I, this is my own bias uh, working here. I would say that theology is speculation that is bound to, history creation like it's bound to the actual uh you know the, the scandal of the particular uh of israel and jesus and uh, the kingdom of god yeah where philosophy in our context has seen itself as kind of free of such boundaries so when i did an analytic philosophy degree at the university of missouri in st louis and most of my um most of my professors were atheists they were um the you, you know, they could do speculation ad nauseum about zombies and consciousness is the one that always comes to my mind yeah. uh, in my philosophy of mind class. Um, or Mary, Mary and colors and all these, you know, that you're not about, you can tell any story about any fictional event, uh, two, two worlds where water is. Yeah, it's water. You know, yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> right. You can do that all day and all night. And I think some of that is actually really valuable and helpful and sharpened me as a thinker and, and a writer. Um, where at the end of the day, the, uh, Theology, we're going to have to say yes, but in, you know, I, I like to tease my my philosopher friends here who I'm uh, good friends with here, 
But, you know, when you say, how many possible worlds are there? You know, well, there's exactly one possible world, the one, you know, the one in which we live, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that's the theological narrowing of philosophical speculation is where, you, you, you know, and I, I'm not saying that dogmatically, like there's one one possible world. Sure. I'm saying that's one way in which you can get down into the biblical world of philosophy. Where we're saying, yeah, actually, possible world scenarios is not off limits for thinking through something, but uh, but can you ultimately ground it in theology, or can your theology ultimately ground uh, that thought experiment? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I just place them as kind of one's one's anchored to reality in a particular way, in which the other one is not. Yeah, that, I think that's helpful. That's that's kind of how I thought about it as well. Uh, is it's it's like it has thicker boundaries, and it's like if you're going to reason in this way, that's part of the the tradition. You're in a in a if you're if you're thinking only in this other analytic tradition or continental, and, and it's not theologically uh, doesn't have theological boundaries. You can go like you said all over the place, but this is in this tradition. This is what you do. Like you're yeah. not if you're going further than this. If you're going different. If you're it's it's a you're putting yourself into a different mind frame or or whatever it is. Yeah, it's it's really tricky. Yeah, I I definitely maybe um I've thought about this a little bit and I don't remember if I mentioned it in the book. I haven't looked at the book in quite a while intentionally, so um I'm afraid to look at it at this point uh, now that it's in in paper. But um yeah. <laughs> the um the you know you think about medical ethics, ethics as a subset of uh, philosophy as a field of philosophy, and you think about medical ethics. Uh, you know, people have thought that it was actually okay ethically to do all kinds of what we now consider horrendous things, um, viviasecting people while they're alive, you know, uh, throwing children into cold water and, and timing how long it takes them uh, to die. And, you know, people have done all kinds of, you know, horrendous things. Mm -hmm. Actually, this is a horrible analogy now that I'm thinking about because it, it makes it sound like speculative ph philosophy is like, you know, that unit in, in Korea. Um so, but uh, what we consider ethical medical ethics is actually based on the Hebraic notion of ethics, uh, that a human being made in the image of God has um, self-same dignity because they are a human being, right? Those are, right. Th those are actually particularized Hebraic notions of ethics that have made their way uh, into um, our medical ethics because we live in a Hebraicized world, right? Uh, most yeah. of our conceptual world, scientific and otherwise, it does not come from the Greeks, as far as I can tell. It comes more so from the um, from the Hebrew Bible and through the New Testament. Yeah. Well, so that that brings uh, that brings us deeper into your work here about uh, the, the Hel Hellenism, and there's this whole you know Hellenistic or the Hellenist theory. Uh, there's there's all this stuff going on here, and it's again, which landmines do you want to step on and all that. But I thought it was really interesting. So we have this Hebraic philosophy, and you said. Um, uh, another one of your insights is that by the time of uh, the Hellenistic period, the the Hellenistic Jews were bending the Hebraic philosophy so much that it, it was to the point of snapping or it had snapped, but that the the NT authors, the New Testament authors, really reclaimed it and brought it back. Right. Um, so I, I thought that's so interesting, and I don't know how <laughs> you want to proceed here. We could talk Hebraic yeah. philosophy first, and then go to NT or or yeah. Let, maybe I should give some of the what I call the genetic markers of Hebraic philosophy. Yeah. So people have a reference because I we've just been throwing the term around. I haven't sure. actually defined what I'm talking about. Yeah, and I know that I know the philosophers will hate that. That's right, <laughs> as they should. Yeah. Um, so I'm not I'm not arguing specifically for an Hebraic philosophy. I'm actually arguing for a, a philosophical style that is distinct. Right, and so in the same way we could say. There's a kind of Hellenistic style that we could all recognize. We could read any document, and at some point we get clues in the way that it's written, the terms they're using, the ideas, the concepts, values, notions. We'd say this sounds like a Hellenist document if we didn't know where it came from. Like we could, we could probably place Hellenistic methodology, um, uh, both methodologically and content-wise. We could we could say like, okay, I don't know where this document's from, but it sounds like. It's written in the Hellenistic period. Yeah. And I think the same thing we can do, uh, there's a there's a philosophical style that we could say, okay, that's actually distinctly Hebraic. And it's it's notionally and methodologically different um, than the Mesopotamians and, and also from the Egyptians. Um, and so the, I, I have two kind of methodological uh, distinctions that I make. One is uh, that it's pixelated. and it, it, I, I, These are caricatures, but you could put it kind of like, 
versus a linear deductive mode, it's pixelated. So you get many instances that are meant to be in the second methodology is that they're, they're networked together. So many instances are networked together through linguistic and conceptual connections in the Hebrew Bible. Mm -hmm. um, and by doing that, they act like pixels in an image. No one pixel represents the, the argument in Toto or the concept in Toto. It's by seeing them together and seeing how they're coordinated together, you can see an image that emerges. So if, if you think about Surat paintings, you know, um, and uh, the pointillist dot paintings, yeah. right? Yeah. No dot of paint itself is the painting or even represents the painting. It's only when you back out and see how various dots are coordinated that an image uh, emerges or a notion yeah. uh, emerges. And so something like that seems to be going on. So pixelated and networked. And then there's these convictions that seem to fund the whole project. So um, it's Mysterianist, which I think maybe you could argue whether other traditions are as well, but uh, it does not have a kind of domesticationist, like we are going to figure this all out bent to it. There's always this you faithfully participate to confidently know, but you're never going to have, you, you don't get behind the curtain on anything. So yeah. you, you could definitely pull on Ecclesiastes here if you want, or Job or something else. Yeah. Um, it's ritualist, which again, I would say the Hellenistic tradition is ritualist in the sense that your body is fully involved in you knowing. Hmm. Uh, the, the, the difference is they don't accredit ritual quite as much. I mean, you do have peripateo, right? The, the peripatetic yeah. tradition as you walk along the way. Right. But if you really like, especially in the Roman uh, schools, it essentially always comes down to your soul, your psyche, something interior to you being transformed in some way. Yeah. Um, and, and that's basically the goal. And by ritualist here, I mean, uh, Mr. Miyagi, like they can transform you into understanding something without you actually knowing how they did it. Right. Yeah. Uh, and that the goal isn't for you to decode all the rituals you participate in. And the goal is for you to participate trustingly in order to see the thing being shown to you. And so yeah. that's a conceptual difference that I think makes a, a difference. Um, they're, they are creationist and like they're fervently creationist. And I don't mean that in any kind of like creationism debate way today. I sure. mean, everything they're saying is rooted in a creation of the universe by Yahweh and, yeah. and they are contiguously connected uh, to that story that is currently unfolding. So nothing is free floating. Nothing is ahistorical in their mind. Everything is rooted not only in history, but in a particular history, if I can use that anachronistic term. Yeah. Um, and then actually what I think to be the most radical difference uh, about the style of Hebraic philosophy is um, that there are no sages. There are no mystics. There are no, you, you, you might want to even put prophets in this category, but you find out later that they don't they're they're not prophets are not special people they there are no elites this is for the farmer as much as it is for uh the prophet who serves uh the king um and so if you want instant if you want like the realization of this in the new testament uh i've got an article out there that hasn't gone to gone out yet but i think it will be on christianity today um where i am pointing out in luke's gospel he yells at farmers for being hypocrites because they know how to interpret meteorology, but they don't know how right. to interpret the present time, right? Yeah. And so that that singular move, right? He's saying like, you're saying like, look, he's not yelling at Pharisees and Sadducees, people who are elite scribal tradition trained in this and you should know better. He's yelling at uh, agrarian subsistence farmers. Yeah. That you through the practice of, of the Torah the practices and the reflection and the Psalm one meditating on the Torah day and night and thinking through these things and intellectually and in, uh, engaged uh, Torah worship that you should actually be able to understand what's going on here. Um, mm. And so, uh, and I think you are, you, you get all of this in the Torah, you get it in the prophets in the, the Psalms and the poetry as well in the Hebrew Bible, but hearing Jesus says it for Christians, that usually sticks a little bit. They're like, Oh dang, well, Jesus said it. Yeah. And I guess we have to listen to it. You know, we have no, we have no choice. We can ignore it if it's in the Torah because we're all That's functional right. Marxists. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The, um, you'd mentioned this this expression uh, philosophy as a way of being a people. Mm. Um, do you? I don't know if that was if that was just kind of offhand or if that is a is a helpful way to summarize what you said. I, yeah. No, actually, it was offhand, but that is a helpful. Way. <laughs> okay. I mean, I. I always come back to Deuteronomy 4. I mean, Deuteronomy is a, t a totality, but Deuteronomy 4 is that, you know, what a wise and discerning uh, people you'll be. A God so near to you, right? So like the the ritual life required to keep God's presence with us uh, mm -hmm. and how the ritual life shapes us and God's presence shapes us, all that whole kit and caboodle. 
um, and that we are wise and discerning through that process somehow, yeah. um, which I have some other monographs that argue for that ritual epistemology in detail if people want mm -hmm. nerdy ad nauseum ad infinitum arguments about those things but um they, they do the, the my audience that's you're speaking yeah. to the right people so i have yeah. a yeah i have a, a book called uh, knowledge by ritual where i i kind of argue for um, the ritual epistemology of the hebrew bible that looks again looks eerily similar to our scientific epistemology mm. um, and in fact, almost overlaps and dovetails uh, seamlessly with what we consider good scientific epistemology. Yeah. Well, so you also mentioned um, that there was a there is a linear mode of argument to the uh, Hebraic philosophy. How how much how much does that characterize them? Because you know, pastors often will say the the way of thinking biblically is is through stories, and it's through yeah maybe it's more cyclical and it's more. Well, but you're you're saying you know, there is a still linear mode of argument, of course. Like so, there can be. Yeah, I think um, I think the the pixelation, which is the look, I, I I struggled endlessly to find the right terms to capture these different characteristics. So yeah. this is the best I got after sure. workshopping it with lots of people. Um, but that kind of pixelation or pointillism, the idea that you don't get it in one shot, you have to see it across. I mean, there's a couple of things that I think that process naturally lends itself to discernment right mm -hmm. so you don't get a definition to carry around in your pocket and then go hunting for instances of it you actually have to form the definition while you're being formed by the reading of the text so there is some there's something linear to that and like the big picture there are little shots of linear arguments in there so they're not, it's not like linear argumentation is wrong or unethical or sure. like oh no no we don't do that stuff around here obviously right. that's in the biblical text as well but when uh, the, I think the chief errors that you see people making when they try to make some like, well, here's what justice means, or here's what, you know, this is the ethical thing to do in this situation, or here's the political philosophy of, they're, they're usually ignoring, they're focusing on some pixels to, uh, to ignore the other ones, right? Mm -hmm. And so there really is this constraining and turning of meaning over and over and over and you know, let me give you one instance. Let me give you another instance that's slightly different. I mean, if anybody who's read the Proverbs, again, I don't deal with the Proverbs in this in this book hardly at all. But if you read through the Proverbs, you realize there's lots of Proverbs that are retold with slight differences in them, right? Mm -hmm. And and a lot of that poetic uh, parallelism. Uh, unfortunately, we think of poetry as this fluffy, you know, expressive stuff, getting the inside of us out on a piece of paper. Yeah. Uh, poetry. I mean, I would argue probably Hebrew poetry is probably the most shrewd philosophical device we have in the ancient world um, mm. because it allows you to do lots of genus differentia distinctions that, you know, Aristotle was in favor of. And I yep. think all of us are in favor of. Here's what it is. Here's what it's not. That's the parallelism of contrast. Here's what it is. And and so much more so it's like this. Right. And so it's, yeah. it's sh sharpening and refining a, a notion and giving you kind of the field in which that notion plays and putting up fences in which, okay, here's where it's crossed into some other notion or it's un useless here. So these are all like highly logical schemes of reasoning. Um, and I, I think what pastors get nervous or I think I was a pastor for a long time. Look, we, we pull cheap moves sometimes. Sometimes it's out of the depth of our being. We're like, no, you don't understand what's going on in scripture. And then sometimes it's like, you know, I don't think you understand what's going on in scripture here, but we don't really have anything to back it up. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. We just have maybe an intuition. Uh, so I think I would want to say there is a, a stylistic difference at work here, but the stylistic difference never excludes anything good going on in Greek or Roman or Enlightenment philosophy. Yeah. Uh, it's not to the exclusion of those things. It's that it does those things differently on the whole, or it, it includes those elements in a different scheme. Yeah. Well, I, I think it, I don't know how many you know non Christians or or people not interested in, in philosophical theology or theology will read this. Hopefully, they do. You know, hopefully this adds to it. That'd be fantastic. But what I've noticed is through reading your work, it it, it has helped me understand uh, secular you know philosophy a little bit more. We, you, I took a screenshot of one of them. Um, I'm not going to share it or anything, but. You, you have dialogue, uh, manual, allegory, sentences, disputations, oh, yeah. meditation entries, synonymous, postscript, treatises, journal entries, uh, personal reflection, aphorisms, essay, novella. And, and you have philosophers next to all of those. You have Nietzsche and, and Montague and Cicero. Uh, Marcus Aurelius doesn't kind of fit in there, but, but he's really, really respected. He doesn't fit with like 
the uh, um, uh, Aquinas or, or Descartes, right, maybe. Right. He's very, very well respected. I thought that was really helpful for me. It's broadened my scope of philosophy as well. You know, it's like, yeah. oh, yeah, you know, sort of studying this this one uh, argument for biblical philosophy, it's it's actually helped me broaden my view of philosophy, uh, simpliciter, as the philosophers yeah. would say. I, I think that's really important, and I'm glad to hear you say that, because mm -hmm. one of the goals, um, I've been conversing with a guy named Brian Van Norden, who's a professor at Yale, or no, he's at Vassar now, um, but he uh, he's been making this argument very publicly in the New York Times, including... Uh, I think the article in the New York Times, it was like, um, if Western philosophy departments won't rename themselves, then let's call them what they really are, European Enlightenment-based philosophy. Oh, I caught that. Yeah, I remember that quote. Yeah. And uh, so he's just been arguing that, like, look, Chinese philosophy is a form of philosophy. He, he's got all the same issues. Uh, yeah. Funny enough, his are more from Western philosophies. Mine are more from Christian philosophers, or it used to be the case. I don't know if it still is. But, you know, they push back and say, no, this isn't philosophy. It's it's revelation. It's theology. It's something else. Um and so I've I've pushed him as well and said, look, you keep on saying Asian philosophy, and it seems like you're only including Southeastern Asian and Central Asian all the way over to Buddhism, and then you stop there. Why are you Why are you not including Mesopotamia? Why are you not including the Hebrew tradition? Why are you not including yeah. e Egypt? Right? And and he he's actually he, he he's taken it all on board and, and agrees wow. that Southwest Asia has its own philosophical tradition as well. And so part of you know, one of the things I'm going to be pushing hard in the next year um, is I'm going to be going, actually going around and talking to people saying, if you have a philosophy department and you teach an Asian philosophy uh, course, you actually need to include this text in the Asian philosophy course, right? Yeah. Um, you can say it's very distinctly different from anything in Central or Eastern Asia, but to say that it's not philosophy is actually just, you know, you're talking out of your rear at that point. Right. Um, yeah. Well, um, so Peter, uh, is it Peter Adamson, maybe he has a, a history of philosophy without any gaps. Yeah, I think, oh, he's okay. at, I think he's at Oxford. And and that's the same thing. He's he's also doing that project because he's he he started a podcast and then he put out a series of, of philosophy books there with Oxford. It's really good. But but likewise, I don't think he has one on, on Hebrew philosophy, on Western Asian philosophy at all. And yeah. he, and he's another guy who's saying we we don't want any gaps. And it's like, well, right. Sir, right. there's a, a large gap you might be right. Missing. Well, and in the world, the Oxford World Encyclopedia, which Brian Van Norden I think contributed to as well, has nothing. Has Islam, it has Jewish philosophy, which is a distinctly different thing. Okay. Um, and but nothing whatsoever on ancient like so. And, and I, you know, I'm I'm kind of pulling that like diversity card, which I deeply believe the diversity is good sure so i'm like it's like it's not just the hebrew bible the mesopotamians got left out here so mark vandermaroop who's a who's a sumerologist or sorry he's a seriologist up at columbia uh, just north of me here in manhattan um he's made the same uh argument philosophy before the greeks he said like look when you i, I actually don't think the mesopotamians have full-fledged philosophy i think yeah. it's it's a harder case to make i think egyptians are Egypt, Egyptologists are like, eh, we can kind of make a soft case. I mean, I've, I've, I've met with these people in workshops and yeah. we've had these discussions, but they all look at the Hebrew Bible and they're like, oh, that that's a slam dunk case. Like, in Yeah, I tell you, 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 had, you have two charts and it's usually, you know, the Egyptians, Mesopotamians and, and Hebrew scriptures are over here. And then you have the, the Greeks and the Romans, but you're like, no, no, the, everyone's there. It should be over here. And then yeah. the kind of more mystically type folks over on that side. And that's cool. Well, too. You can study that, but I want, I want to point out that wasn't me making that assertion. I was representing the assertion of ancient Near Eastern scholars who, oh, okay. who, who know all this literature and they know all the Greek and, and Roman literature and they're the ones who think that. So okay. yeah, I, I'm glad you pointed that out though. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so what's really interesting and I didn't get a chance to, to dive in as deep as I wanted to on this section, but uh, Hellenistic uh, Judaic philosophy in the new Testament and how they, they recaptured it. They reclaimed it. Uh, what's the Christian word? Uh, retrieval. This, yeah, it's our restorement. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so can, can you tell us about that? How did how did New Testament scholars retrieve this Hebraic philosophy? Yeah. Um, I so that I will admit this is probably the most controversial part of that book. Okay. And 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 the part where I'm expecting to get schooled pretty heavily. I mean, I, I ran it by some Pauline scholars and New Testament scholars, but. I, I'm sure I'm missing something there, but I, but I still think there's something true about it. What's remarkable is um, 
as you read what we call the Old Testament pseudepigrapha or all, all the Hebrew Jewish text written before the New Testament and then during that time and then uh, up until the destruction of the temple or Bar Kokhba, um, it's a it's a massive literature. I mean, here I got two. Like, we're we're talking about this is a big literary tradition. This is this. I don't even have the Dead Sea Scrolls in here. I mean, this is a massive tradition of literature yeah. with which Jesus and his disciples would probably all be familiar with many of those stories. In fact, you see them crop up in little weird places, like one of these pseudepigraphal or uh, apocryphal stories shows up when the Sadducees ask Jesus, you know, say there's a woman who marries a man and, and dies seven times, right? Well, that's uh, Judith, I think, um, that that's referring to. Um, mm -hmm. So it shows up in those kinds of ways. But when you look at, uh, now I can say this really confidently in Luke and the Gospel of Mark, uh, a little less confidently in Matthew, just because I haven't studied them as closely. Sure. Uh, and, and then Gospel of John, maybe less confidently as well. But none of them are, like if you think about what's the playbook for the way, the notional, the, the second order reasoning way they think about the world, what are the notions, the invisible notions do, uh, do they use to think about the world? They never go to any of that Hel Hellenistic Jewish material. Yeah, um, they only go to the Hebrew Bible, um, and, and including Paul as well. Uh, and I had to do a little work to show that. Fortunately, a bunch of books came out right around the time I was finishing writing this, where people were making Pauline scholars were making the exact same argument from nice. Paul's rhetoric. So that like was a, whew, I was very very happy to read many of those books, um, but. Uh, that you know the only comparison i can make here is you know if if you ask somebody to give you like the history of music from the stone age to the present right and so they mm -hmm. give you this long soliloquy about um banging rocks together all the way up to flutes and lyres and then you get to baroque music in the uh, you know the 17th century and then now we have taylor swift right you're like wait 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just passed over some of the, in some ways, some of the most formative uh, changes in music happened, you know, in, in the last three centuries. Um, and there's no way that you're not going to, and they just go, oh yeah, d just pick it up with Taylor Swift and you're fine, right? Like, there's a way in which you have to say, like, that's not, that's a critique in some way. That That is a statement about that, um, the, the conceptual world. I think... What I did is I took those genetic markers that um, pixelation, networking, mysterianism, ritualism, creationism, and um, trans demographic, uh, that, that stylistic uh, view. And I just said like, look, okay, when we get into Hellenistic Judaism, now here's a caricature of Hellenism, uh, which I kind of put on a continuum with these. So pixelated and linear arguments, uh, networked arguments versus uh, autonomous arguments. Anyways, it's, it's more detailed than we want right now, but... Uh, I just said, here's a sliding scale where you can kind of see a caricature of Hellenism and a caricature of, of Hebraic uh, style. And you can kind of move through Hellenistic Jewish texts. And I could only do a couple of them because it's just one, two chapters in a book. Right. Um, and you can almost move the sliders over and see these hybridizations of these two. And some of them were full on Hellenism with a splash of Hebraic notions. Some of them are protectionist texts. So like to be Hellenistic is to be evil. And so if you think about like the the rejectionist movements, both within the, the Apocrypha, the Pseudepigrapha, the Dead Sea Scroll community. Um, but even then, they're rejecting almost like a Hellenistically intertwined view of Judaism. It's not like they're rejecting um, pure Hellenism or pure Torah worship or something okay. like that. It's, it's already it's already mixed atmosphere at that point. Yeah. Um, and then when you just put those side by side, apples to apples, as I like to say, uh, with somebody like what Paul is doing, and you and you realize, okay, Paul is obviously ensconced in Hellenist Hellenism. He he right. understands it well. Whether he's trained in it or not fully is a whole other question. He certainly understands. He breathes the air of Hellenism and understands what he's breathing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. And and is ready to redeploy Hellenism at his whim. But when you look under the surface of the hood, to mix all my metaphors here. Um, <laughs> of what he's deploying, it's always the Hebraic style and the Hebraic content and notions right. that he's delivering. Yeah. So uh, the wolf in sheep's clothing or the sheep in wolf's clothing, I'm not sure which one I've used in the book, but um, even he, uh, and even, you, you know, there's a few syllogisms that everybody loves with Paul, but I, I, 
I don't know if you went into this is the part that I really buckled down and I just did some like basic formal logic of Paul's arguments. Mm. And then I had to sit down with one of my my friends here, Josh Blander, who's a medieval uh, philosopher. And um, and we really struggled to make sure we were getting that right because it's it's actually a lot more complicated than it seems. Yeah. And even then, dozens of missing premises and everything he says and all kinds of narratives are being assumed. Uh, yeah. Premises aren't even, they're not even premises, they're entire narratives, historical narratives that are being presumed. And you're like, wait, wait, he doesn't have this like linear deductive autonomous logic as the master of reason here. He has something like there's something reasonable about this, um, but there, there's a way I can present it in, to you in a way that you're comfortable with. But as long as we both know at the end of the day, the way I'm presenting it to you is is because I know, let me put this in a way that you'll understand it kind of language rather than here's how I would say this ideally. And I think anybody who's taught and you get these off-ended questions from students that really just reveal how ensconced that student is in American culture or thinking or, you know, like when I teach Bible, when people are like, oh, so does this determine whether people go to heaven or not? And I'm like, I'm, I don't know if the biblical authors even care about whether people go to heaven. Like, I'm, I'm, not sure that, I'm not sure that's a big deal. I think they might be waiting for the resurrection instead, right? Like, yeah. and, 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 but then you stop and go, okay, I know what you mean by heaven. Let me put this in a way that you can understand. And, and, I, and you rejigger your argument uh, to, to the pablum of their society, right? Yeah. Um, and John Pennington, Jonathan Pennington, dear friend, has um, done a lot to show how Jesus does this exact same thing. Yeah. Which to me just indicates that it's a tradition. Right, right. Yeah. You you may have missed out on an analogy there, though. You talked about a wolf in sheep's clothing, but you, you might have said, you know, Paul's putting his stuff in, in a wooden horse because it's uh, <laughs> Greek in the context. Even better, even better, yeah. <laughs> the second edition. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought I think that's really that's really a, a helpful clarification as well. Um, sometimes Christian philosophers will try to proposi propositionalize Paul and it's not really his style. That's okay. Yeah. He's not the Greek philosophers weren't even really like that, you know? And so yeah, I, I think that's the, the fair, uh, I, I, he, Paul is a complicated guy, right? Yeah. Like I think anybody who's taught undergrads or actually been a pastor or like everybody knows this feeling where what you're dealing with is this rich, thick thing. And everybody wants to kind of pare it down to something more simpler, simple right. or a category that they can think of it through. And you can see him struggling constantly with that um, that issue, and and so. But what's interesting to me is he always pulls them back to, not like, hey, remember that slick argument I gave you? Just put that in your pocket, and you're gonna go. He's like, no, no, no. Remember how I lived when I was among you? Remember how I taught you as children? And like his care and his love for them, and that like, remember we we spent days together, and there, that it's that embodied habitus, which again. I don't think the Greeks are entirely opposed to that view. I think you get lots of uh, Greco-Roman tradition that understands the body and habitus and um, and working through things together. It just always ends up making that final turn away from the body. You know, the body is deceptive, and we got to go back to the tranquility of the soul. And mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, there are large chunks of church tradition, um, e even some of the plain vanilla pablum, you know, Christianity that a lot of my my freshmen walk in off the streets with. Um, that think that Christianity is all about tranquility of the soul as well. Um, yeah. Not not that not that it has nothing to do with tranquility, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they they have these same notions in their head. It's all about tranquility of the soul, and then every pastor and youth leader and and uh, you know campus minister is trying to say well, like, well, you need to put your body in the right habits. You need to like think about the community, you know. And they're like, no, no, I just want to believe the right things. You're like, right. oh, that's a heresy called Gnosticism. We need yeah. to get you out of that, right? So Yeah, but you read a little bit of Paul, and he's like, I beat my body and make it my own. <laughs> right. That's a little bit different. Right, right. You, you really do have to read Paul selectively to get there. So mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, that's another thing about Paul that, that in reading Paul, it's similar to the Hebraic uh, – Hebraic philosophy that you mentioned where it's not there, there's not all these um, tight little rules. This is Ten Commandments, but there's a whole Old Testament there, too. And it's you have to think about it yourself. It right. is, it's speculative, but it's it's not in a bad way. Right. You have to own this. You have to become this. You have to chew on this daily and meditate on it and meditating on it. You don't meditate on like a, a simple rule. You know, right. you got the rule, but you meditate on something that's worth meditating and you chew on something that's thick and able to be chewed on. And I, right. I think that's, that's similar with Paul. And I, I, uh, I caught, well, it's in one of his letters. Um, 
I'm drawing a blank right now where it was, but he he talks he brings up the liar paradox. I think it's the, the Epimenides paradox, and he's like, you know, all all Cretans are liars. Right, uh, right, right. He goes, this, this is true. Titus, like, right? Titus, it is in Titus, yeah. yeah. And it's like, Paul, did you just fall into the blunder? Did you just mess with? <laughs> it's like, well, no, he's doing something right. different. He's right. he's being funny. He's using witticism or, or right. Jewish irony or something. Um, it's deeper than just the the logic chopper in me wants to go. Yeah, it's exactly right. And that's and it's the, it's those are the precise hurdles you see people or traps maybe you see people falling into when they want Paul to be a certain way. Yeah. Um, and he just refuses. And same thing with Jesus. I mean, they're the two roundest characters in, in scripture. Mm. You, you never know what they're going to say next. You know, <laughs> Jesus, anybody approaches them, is like, is he going to call her a whore, a dog, or, or blessed are you for, you know, Seriously. you just never know, right? Seriously. Or get behind me, Satan. It's like, I don't know if I'd ask him anything after that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Which to me are, are all indicative um, that discernment is the key. And discernment yeah. happens through polyvalent multiple encounters with the same true reality you know and this is where i'd say okay so uh platonism or middle platonism have i think have some teeth and truth here right as you say there is something about encountering a bunch of different horses and discerning that there's something horsey about the horses right there's yeah. there's something about that discernment process that's right and true and and, and built into us yeah um it's just when you posit that there has to be an eternal, unchangeable form of the horse in the heavens or now in God's mind, I guess, in the Augustinian version. Yep. Um, that's that's where you, I think you run into a few problems. Yeah. Don't go. Don't don't hammer that too hard there. I'm, uh, I might be still in Augustine. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, um, Dr. Jensen, I wanted to end here. So we, I think we've given people a reason to, to, to buy it. Certainly, there's so much to it that we could do a 10 part series on this. Um, it's really good. I really, really enjoyed it. And it's I appreciate it's, that. Well, and it's cool because you do go through, you'll, you'll talk about the, the two dogmas of empiricism from Quine and it's like, okay, dude, he, he's done his, his homework. That's fun to see that in there in a book about Hebraic uh, philosophy. So I, I thought that was huge. How, how do you think this can bless Christian philosophy? Mm. Uh, I wrestle with this question. Mm. Um, I, I was thinking about this just the other day. Am I actually telling Christian philosophers and, and really just say Christians? Because I think there's, I actually think everybody's responsible to be philosophically yes, amen, adept man. in some way. I think it's actually the call of the Torah that Jesus re reinforces. Amen. Um, so am I telling philosophers? I mean, well, you, you'll notice something in the book. Did I argue from a pixelated networked scheme i mean my arguments were very linear right i was a i was the way i'm trained the way i know you could hear it and and people could hear it today i adapted my own um arguments to the the ways that i knew they could be accepted or at least heard or, and reasoned with in some ways and i think that's that's part of what i want people to get is that um you know uh there's some improvisational re reasoning that goes on between people where you're you're basically if, if you're really trying to reason with somebody out of love you're kind of mm -hmm. handing them a stick that they can whittle for themselves in some way this is a bad analogy so it's going to break <laughs> down very quickly but you're handing them something they can use right you're handing them a tool maybe maybe you're handing them a wrench instead of a hammer for the right job um that will be good for them in that particular context maybe, maybe 10 years later it wouldn't be good for that it's the wrong context they moved on they're onto something else right I do think there is something that all Christians need to understand. Uh, so here, here's the big thing for Christian philosophy. And I think this is a boom for Christian philosophy as a, as a dying art right now, because I think there's a lot of Christian philosophers that are just out there like saying, nobody appreciates what we do. Yeah. There are tons and think, of yeah. And I think this is a way in which the church can come back and say like, Oh, okay. Now that your lay person is not going to say, Oh, there's epistemology in scripture. Therefore, but, you can say, like, I was a pastor. People would say things like, I think God called me to do this, so I'm going to go do that. And I'm going to like, and I say, wait, wait, there is a patterned reasoning, uh, reasoning through knowledge and confident knowledge in scripture that has component parts that are kind of fixed and unmovable. So if you want to, if you say you think this is true, you can actually test that according to scripture. And there are, and, and you do it within a community and there have to be people who have some authority who can guide you through that process with the goal at the end of that, you can know something that you couldn't have known otherwise, that you can see something that you couldn't have seen otherwise, even if it was there the whole time, you just couldn't see it. Yeah. 
I think understanding that um, and understanding things like uh, political philosophy, which is, you know, surprise, surprise, has become a huge deal in the last couple of years, right? Yeah, um, reason. yeah I'm not sure. But th that the biblical authors have something to say, actually, about political philosophy, even though they have no idea of a representative democracy. Sure. They have something to say about policing, even though they have no, there, there are no police. There aren't even jails in ancient Israel. Jeremiah had to be thrown in a cistern because there wasn't even a jail in Jerusalem, right? Because there is no Torah provision for jails, right? right, right. No incarceration. Um, so th they don't even have a concept of jail and incarceration, uh, but they certainly have things to say about uh, police reform incarceration today, right? And so I think it actually, it, for me, the best thing that could happen here is that Christian philosophers could kind of lead the way as a resourcement uh, to the scripture as the intellectual life that we've always needed. Yeah, it, it does take, I will admit, you do kind of have to learn how to read scripture anew in order to see some of this stuff. It's usually just flat literary reading where you just kind of like go through and say, all right, what was the narrator trying to say? What was the conflict? What was the resolution? How are they framing this? Why do they keep coming back to, why do they keep using this word over and over again in all these different contexts? You know, why is God doing evil? Like yeah. that's an easy one, right? Um, right. How many theodicies have you read that address the issue that God perpetrates evil all the time in the Hebrew Bible, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I think, A, it's exciting. It's a whole, like, I think a lot of Christian philosophers will be able to reapproach scripture and say, oh, wow, there's a whole world down here that I've somewhat appreciated, but I, I can now more deeply appreciate. And I think for Christians, like, you can tell them Aquinas said something all day long, but when they see, but I think Aquinas understood things because he soaked in the text and really understood and lived in a community that understood the text. Yeah. Um, and I think for most Christians, you need to be able to show them from scripture. Let me mm -hmm. show you five places in scripture that talk about um, how you know things confidently. And once you see these five things, you can test it further, see if there's more, see if this is wrong, see if we need to shape it more. Um, then it becomes a, okay, so now anytime we're talking about how do we know things, we need to keep these issues in mind, right? Yeah. We're talking about metaphysics. How far can we go? When should we pull back like Icarus from the sun? Um, I think, I think we have guidance in scripture and it, it excites me that it's again, in this book, I didn't try to lay all this out. I just right. tried to say like, look, there's a whole, like there's a Mars here for us to land on, um, yeah. in some way. Well, and, it, and you, we've talked about this off air, but it's like you're ringing the bell. Like it's time to go. It, it, it's yeah. here, you know, and what's cool is you're a, you're a, a biblical scholar, but you're giving permission. Hey, it's okay to do this, guys. Like you can go do this. And, and, yeah. and Dr. Pennington is a New Testament scholar and he's saying, you guys can do this. Go ahead. Um, there there have been Christian philosophers doing, you know, hard at work at this. Uh, Walter's door from Williams. Uh, right. Moser does a Moreland. I, I want to just get, shout out some names. Um, William Rain, Wainwright. Dallas Willard, uh, you know, Dallas Tell Willard, um, yeah. Billy, Billy Abraham, my good buddy. Yeah, uh, I saw yeah. That, that he, yeah. yeah, he read it uh, earlier copy. Yeah, um, yeah, Haldane and Getz. So there are Christians doing this. I think what, what I'm most excited about this is not, it's not that that they haven't been doing it, they have been doing it, but man, Lord willing, the work of, of you and Dr. Pennington will wake up the rest of the Christians to it. Yeah. And they'll go and, and all these, these Christian, Steve Evans, and, you know, even like C.S. Lewis more uh, as a philosopher, and right. there's a lot of work on him as a philosopher lately, Gordon Clark or Van Til, whoever, like the Christian Christians to wake up and say, we are philosophers. We do yep. follow, follow the, the true philosopher king. It's my duty then to think through what is what's a retributive justice? You know, what is right. that? Right. You know, and, and for you guys to be saying it, this is the tradition. It's it's not just um, after after the it's not the early church only, but it's the the. OT scriptures as well. This is the people who we are. Yeah. And I think, you know, if I could get people to make one conceptual turn in their mind, and I, I have had the habit of saying this a lot more lately, is um, we're, we're talking about an intellectual tradition. And when I say intellectual, I mean spirit, because people are like, what do you mean by intellectual? I mean, sp spiritual in the same way that Paul used the word spiritual. It's whole bodied community uh, that's aimed at discernment uh, so that we can, we can bring, the, uh, excuse me, we can bring the kingdom of God in the way that we've been yeah. Uh, designed to. Um, so yeah, yeah, for me, it's terribly exciting. And as we said off air, I do not think I have this all figured out. I'm, I'm kind of depositing this in front of my colleagues and saying, show me where I, I've got something true and right and good. And let's go with that. And feel free to like 
tear into me and show me where I'm blind or naive or miss the boat on something. I'm, you know, I'm beyond, I'm old enough now that I'm not terribly afraid that I didn't read that one book that explains all this all anymore. I just assume that book is out there already and I'm That's right. going boldly into my own ignorance. So that, that is kind of one of the, one of the things that you learn in, in academics is uh, you kind of just have to take the step because you'll never, if you wait till you read everything, oh, yeah. Everyone's yeah. publishing every year and there's new dissertations and yes. hey, look, I'm, I'm coming with a posture of humility. You can correct me and it will help me think. But I, I really appreciate that about you and, and your project here. Um, if people want to find you, um, where, where can they find you at? Uh, well, my main narcissism hole is at drewjohnson.com, D-R-U Johnson.com. Uh, and yeah, I think I'm, I'm at the King's College in New York City. Great place to be. New York City is great these days because there are no tourists. So it's beautiful here. <laughs> if you want to come visit us at the King's College, yeah. send your children immediately. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, I'm, I'm out and about um, on the internet. I'm on Twitter all the time. So. Yeah. Seeing you there. Uh, one more time for the folks at home. Uh, when, when does the book arrive in, in the U.S.? I think it's supposed to be here at the end of April and, cool. and be, be ready for sale. You can pre-order now. Oh, oh also... Uh, they're doing a paperback at the same time as hardback, which I was oh, really cool. fortunate. Um, so for $28 with, with the code P H I L 2021 on Cambridge's website, you can get it for $28, which for a Cambridge book is a really, <laughs> it's a really good price. Yeah, it really so I think it's all year long with that, with that code, you can get it for $28. So, okay. Man, that's awesome. I would give it away if people if people would read it. I would just give it to them, but Cambridge doesn't want me to do that. So. Well, workers worth his wages there. That's probably that's probably something uh, he break in there, anyways. I'm sure. <laughs> um, well, this this uh, is going to have to do it for now. But uh, Dr. Johnson, I would love to have you back on. We could talk all sorts of stuff. It seems like we have a lot of common interests. Oh yeah, you're, you're further along, so you can totally help pull me up. Um, but for now, that's going to have to do it. This has been Parker's Pensies, and as always, all glory to God. <laughs>